8.45 tonight okay. is another total highlight tonight. Uh, Claudia uh, Gordon Pomares is the shining star uh, in the field of autism, uh, really worldwide. She's developed some fantastic, simple tools that everybody can learn, and she's going to teach us some uh, how to improve uh, the, uh, every aspect of autism. And it's, it's a really huge, it's a huge advance in our area, and yet uh, she hasn't been discovered quite yet. I did, and I'm kind of totally blown away by what she is bringing to the table. So please arrange your dinner in a way that you don't miss that. Uh, she developed a, a series of steps and tools that mothers and fathers can learn how to help the child along the way, which is completely different and new from anything else that we had. You know, we have an institute here in Seattle, the Handel Institute, and there is floor time, and there's all these methods that were out there before that are considered the golden standard. And she really came in with a completely new idea that actually works, which is different from what we had before. And so uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here, Claudia, and uh, I'm excited. I'm probably the most excited person to listen to you here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So, I will speak slowly. <laughs> or I may do a little tap dance or something. Um, our wonderful person taking care of the technique technicality of everything that if you start dancing tell me because the mic may fall I didn't promise <laughs> that I would not I'm so happy to be here it's a big step for me to be talking to professional to experts and um, meet with people who do things um, with great expertise using tools that I have no idea about um, I'm fascinated by uh, the different um, uh, of proposition that you make, and um, uh, it's just exciting to get together. And I hope that I can give you a little bit of information that you can take home and uh, share with the families you work with, and just for yourself. So. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I don't think you have an answer to it, or to them. Do you want to do that right now? Do you want to be able to do that? There you go. <laughs> okay, at least you got me one answer. And, well, by the end of the presentation, we will do that. Well, too bad for those who won't be here to know exactly, to live the experience of the power of smell and touch. You have, most of you, a little cup um, on your desk, and you don't eat what's in there, but you are going to smell it. And you don't, you're not close enough to each other, so I hope you can sort of turn around to the left or to the right and expose you back to your neighbor. Can you do that for me? Come on. And I'm going to, it's a very scientific experiment. Be serious here. Okay. So what I want you, well, for those who don't have somebody um, on their back, too bad. You know about what is going on. I want you to all put the sand to your nose, put the little cup, a little smell there, you have it. Okay, and now I want whoever is your neighbor to do gentle back rub with the fingertips. This is scientific, okay? Do it right. Okay, are you doing it? You have to smell at the same time, very important. Okay? It's happening or not? Yeah. You don't have a cup? <laughs> Come on. And turn around, do it to the next person that was so nice to do it to you. So we're double the effect. 
Okay, come. Here we go. Here's the dopamine flowing. Yeah, nice, 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 good. Stop. <laughs> okay. Scientific experiment. I want a show of hands. Uh, goosebumps. Show of hands. Okay, thank you. The, did you feel them? Oh, what did I do? <laughs> this next slide or the slide before? Okay. Okay, show of hands now. Goosebumps. Okay. <sighs> Who had a sigh? Ha. Yeah. Oh. Okay, you just experimented an increase of serotonin in your brain. This is how hard it is. Already you know what I'm doing and what I'm teaching the parents and the professionals. How to use the tools that God gave us. Thank you. So, I would say 100% success because those who didn't feel it probably are still with the, what was it, red wine? <laughs> I don't know. So what did just happen? There you go. The answer to the question, and we are going to take it step by step. Somebody wants to come in. That's so sweet, the knock. <laughs> oh, first scientific discovery. Dr. Michael Lian, 1997, he's not the first one to work about it, he's the first one I read uh, about this topic. And what does he find? He finds that if you smell something that you really enjoy, and maybe you don't enjoy the pick I gave you, but you double the production, the production of dopamine in your brain. This is a scientific discovery. Well, it gets better. If you add to this olfactory stimulation a pleasurable tactile or visual or auditory, you have 400% increased dopamine at no cost. Are you going to tell? Please do. This is the fabulous thing about science. It's knowledge. It's for free. When you have it, you take it home, and it works. You can double check that. Um, Dr. Klinghardt did a fabulous job. You don't have to take notes. If you have the book, you have everything, all the information in there, so you don't have to double check. OK. When I read a new scientific discovery, my first reaction is to say, I got it. Uh, hello, Dr. Lian, how did you do it? Or hello, Dr. Horvitz. Okay. And then, okay, who needs it? When you really feel very stressed or when well, you know, things are not going your way, you may have something called a tantrum. But usually adults don't have tantrums. We, we, have, such, we have our nerves or something, you know. I'm going to show you what happens to uh, loss of control and smell. Powerful. This is knowledge. Take it home. <laughs> you have it in your cup. 
We call it Centrum 911. Really, a smell, a beautiful scent will do the job for you, for a distressed child, for a senior in distress. Any nice scent will do it. We have a blend that we tweaked um, that is based with fruit, and mainly uh, the basis is strawberry. Because I worked in NICU for something like 17 years, and I used it almost by accident to stop seizures and to promote feeding in infants. So we kept using it because, well, it works. So really, what I wanted to do after learning and studying and listening to the scientists and my teachers was to say, well, if it works, how do we do it? Knowledge and what are the doors to get into the brain? There is the mouth or the skin. You can send things into the bloodstream and go and help the brain do the job. Or you can use very natural ways that are more accessible because you saw it. A child will smell because he's breathing, where it's maybe sometimes harder to uh, do a medic medication. And use those natural doors to eventually promote healing. Working definitely not by observing the symptoms that are just the final uh, part of the story, but looking at the brain, which is what you have done during all the seminar, finding where in the brain is the mistake. Once you find where is the mistake, you want to find what type of flaw is happening on the neuron. And then when you do the type of work I do, and many of you do that, is addressing the problem at the source, the molecular level, which is the synaptic button. For those who may have forgotten between this afternoon and now um, how it works, we have two types of communication in the brain, electricity and chemistry. Why do we have neurochemicals in the brain? Because the cells need to talk to each other, and the electrical message cannot go from one cell to the next. Why can't it? Why can't message from one neuron go electrically to the next? Yeah, this is the synapse, but why? Why is it, why, how come it's not an electrical message from top to bottom? No way, I'm getting there. Keep talking. Okay, keep talking. All right. What is the problem? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question that's very simple to answer. Who has a skin? Well, I'm legally blind. You need to tell me. All of you, thank you very much. Now, you can all, because there is lighting, um, if you look at your hand, they are probably the only cells that you can see with your own eyes. Can you see those little cells? Yeah? Tell me they are attached, please. <sighs> What's the point? Why do we have uh, skin cells that are well attached? Yeah, protection, barrier, so that what is outside doesn't go in and in and out and so forth. Good job. Okay. So that's what about the skin, bones. Everybody has bones, I would assume, because it goes, yeah, everybody, yeah. Somebody could have no bones. You could tell me. I cannot do anything about it, but I would be interested. So bone cells, what's their job? To keep our body sort of sturdy, help us walk. Are they well attached? We, we're going to assume they are. Yes, they are. Otherwise, we have a big bag of skin with powder in it. Yeah, Doesn't work too well. OK, so liver cells, are they attached? That's a little review of biology. Yeah, OK. Uh, hair. For those who have some. <laughs> Those you have are attached to the, well, okay, so that works. We have cells in the body that are not attached. Ooh, look at that. 
brain cells are not in contact. And this is the magical thing about brain cells. That means if one cell is broken, fair enough, get out of the way, we can replace you. If a skin cell makes a mistake, you have to remove it. And if you don't do that, it will talk to the other cells and you have a cancer or something really bad. So this is why you have neurochemistry, because there is no contact. And if there is no contact, the electricity cannot go. This is probably what you said with very beautiful words over there, right? So this is the neurochemistry of the brain. This is serotonin. This is dopamine. This is everybody else. Interesting or not? <laughs> All right. Two neuromediators have been more specifically studied, and I cannot tell you why, but we know a lot about serotonin and dopamine, and I know that you have received a lot of information during the, uh, this whole seminar, so I'm not going to make a big class about it. I will just review a little bit. Dopamine, your best friend. Oh, dopamine makes you happy. Good mood, motivation, control of movement, memory. If your dopamine is good, this is what is going on. That is good. So sometimes, let's say 5 in the morning, you have to take a plane. Uh, you're not feeling so dopamine. So you're going to do something. What are you going to do to trick your brain and tell your brain, oh, we've got so much energy? Double there you mocha. go. Double mocha. <laughs> okay, double mocha is the deal. Cappuccino works too. Um, really, dark chocolate will work. Tea, stimulant, right? That's why. There are other stimulants. We don't name them because they are not legal. <laughs> but they work too. They do make you feel, yay, I think. I don't know. <laughs> People say, and they pay a lot of money to get it, so I suppose it works. So sometimes um, you want to help a child whose erratic dopamine prevents him from being focused. Focused, not focused, focused, not. So no learning possible. So you're going to uh, figure ways. And tonight we have discovered one, which is smelling. We will talk about it some more. If your dopamine level is not appropriate, you'll get some of that or all of it at one time in your life. So you're not there. You want to be there, right? Serotonin is the peaceful one. You feel so good. You're so, ah, you sleep well and you feed properly, and you don't have a fit ever, and you don't show the finger to somebody on the road. Nothing. <laughs> I don't do that. I can't drive. They don't let legally blind people drive. I don't know why. I still have my license. You know what? I can drive in France. <laughs> in France, you have your driving license for life. When I arrive in Canada, they said, you don't want to drive ever again, do you? Why? <laughs> I don't have a problem with driving. So your serotonin level is good. All that is happening for you. That's wonderful. It's not good. You'll get that. Or some of it or more of it. Diabetes type 2, did you know, was re is related to a uh, shortage of serotonin seizures. Um, a lot of major major problems. What did we do, just for, to remind those who missed a scientific experiment because they were late, we found a way to increase serotonin in the brain instantly, right? How do we do that? The sense of touch, right? Uh, very recently, you must have seen an interview of a scientist who discovered that uh, sudden infant death is caused by a shortage of serotonin. And he said this is a horrible thing because we cannot do blood works on every newborn. 
And if we could, there's nothing we can do. Because the only option for the medical field would be um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You cannot really do that. Oh, wait a minute. Cuddles will work. The sense of touch will work. So what did we do? We used the hand, and we used just a wonderful smell. Every parent that you work with has at least one hand. And as therapist, when you are in the office and a child is in distress and you really cannot really work, well, you can access that too. What smells really nice? Well, I'm French, so bread, fresh bread, I don't know. Well, you ha we have European here, so when I know, they know what French, fresh bread is. Um, it has to be pleasurable. And did I hear a question? No? Don't hesitate to stop me, right? I love to talk more than I have to. <laughs> so this is the little bottle I told you about and I showed you from far, the Tantrum 911, that works so wonderfully. Research about the sense of smell is almost daily bringing new information. Basically, five years ago, which is yesterday in research, started wonderful studies, and I know that you have been uh, shown some of that, is functional MRI. So functional MRI of the sense of smell has demonstrated that not only it is going to promote increase of production of dopamine, it will also promote activation in the amygdala, in the frontal cortex, limbic system. So imagine a person in a coma state. There's nothing you can do, but that person is breathing. Then you can promote brain healing. Because, well, I'm from France. I don't speak that well English. We have very complicated names for our exercises with the MAPS treatment, like gentle claw. <laughs> that is very. There's probably a way to say it more sophisticated, but um, this is the way you do it. Just if you have your hand and the tip of the fingers, why is that? Because you want to cover as much surface of the back as you can with five pointers. I suppose that. Well, God could have made us with six, and then we would have six now. Who has six? <laughs> I've heard people who come to seminars sometimes have things to, that are different. So, the yawn. This is ultimate, right? And it is the yawn, the sigh, is saying serotonin is increased in production. We need more oxygen. We can explain it scientifically. Otherwise, it's just a yawn. We use, uh, in our protocols, the sense of touch, which is located in the skin, a very thin layer. We do not address muscle message. We do not go any further than barely feeling it. One of the receptors, that's the face it has, will go directly and talk to the brain and the sense of touch in the brain is covering a small uh, width, but an enormous surface. It talks to almost every part of the brain. Again, science tells us, cuddle people. One of the first scientists I read, Professor Meany, discovers that, and you have seen that research, I'm certain, that gentle touch will promote serotonin uh, increase in the brain of the animal model in the same manner if you use a little brush that is like the mother's tongue as if the pup is uh, licked by the mother. Not saying that we can replace moms, saying that there is one receptor that takes the message, take it to the brain, and tell the brain we are producing more serotonin. 
So here it is. Like, imagine duct tape. It goes all the way, and it's neighbor to most of the um, crucial areas of the brain. If you are starting an activity in the sense of touch, you're also working with fine motor of the fingers, with speech, with uh, mental image, with memory. The typical standard human being is using that. The inside of hands and the lips. And in Europe, there is another, but which we're not. This is the American version. <laughs> we can, what is the good message of this little guy here? This should show a lady. I don't know why they show a guy. But is, OK, we've done the lips and the hands. Leave the hands and the lips alone. How about you work on the arm? or in the leg, or on the back. Those are completely open to uh, dendrogenesis growth. So this is what the guy will look like. You will have more receptors. You will have more information, more ability to produce serotonin. I have run an experiment with a group of adults and I told this group of, oh, sorry, his name is Cody, he is 41 years old. When he was young, he was autistic. As adults, he is an adult with special needs. Rhonda, Rhonda wants to smell. Look, Cody. We are going to offer him, I'm going to offer him a smell, and you're going to see what he will do with it. This is our first meeting. Yeah, it's a camera. Look. He's totally terrified by the world. He smells with his ear. The nose. Ah! Cody. When we first met this group, we said, send us the five worst. So they sent the five men that they were the most afraid of. And every day, they would bring them in, and I would do a map session with them. This is a month later. And we are working on the sense of touch. This is a person that nobody could come close to. You've seen him. He would hit everybody who would come closer than the length of the arm. Gradually, he starts to love his hand, love finding and discovering. The world is so nice. No more rocking back and forth. No more yelling. No, and look at that. So this is a maps exercise, <laughs> right? Discovering touch with parts of your body that you would not typically be touching with. Creating more pathways, increasing serotonin production, calm. And I wanted to make sort of a statement when I work with those guys. You're going to see him read his first letter. Very good. Yeah, I'm a little bit, a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> That's me. So, <laughs> somebody else knows me here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Knowing where everything is in the brain is the way to go, maybe fix the neighbor of the broken part. And this is one of uh, the specificities of what I do is if somebody doesn't talk, I leave the mouth alone. Because my approach is the words are not inside the mouth. Let's work around the fine motor and the breathing and the auditory and gradually the overload of new cells will migrate. The brain is fantastic for that. You've learned that, right? Is the brain wants to heal itself. Just give it the tool. This is one of our best friends, Wilbur. Thanks to Wilbur, we know most of what we know today. Because why is there animal research? Because it's not legal to open up people. So we open up other mammalians, and we learn so much. 
since functional MRI and a lot of new studies that are coming up, we are now able to verify all this knowledge with people. And quite recently, 2002, scientists were able to develop a, an autistic mouse. Because in order to really verify, maybe try some medic medication or new kinds of treatment, you don't want to try them on children, you want to first start trying on the animal model, they could not do that with autism. So what did they do? They broke down the serotonin system because we know that autism has as main issue a serotonin system that's dysfunctional. And they observed in those mouse or mice um, what we observe in children or adults with autism. So from this tremendous advance, they are now able to uh, study better, to know more, and tell us more. And then we can use that knowledge. Okay, I know I've read the book and I know that you have um, heard about stress. You just you came here and you learned what stress is, right? Before that, you know, stress, what is that? <laughs> like me, stress, what is that? <laughs> well, how do we do to help somebody Increasing serotonin with a sense of touch when that person does not want you to touch them. Show of hand, do you have in your practice children or adults who don't want to be touched? Two, three? Yeah, many of you. And we need to. We need to repair the serotonin system. We have one tool, the sense of touch, but that person will not let me come close. You have seen one way, which is bringing something and letting that person come to the input instead of bringing the input to the person. Because why is the first thing that stress does? Do you know? You, you must know. What happens when a person is stressed in your brain? Come on, tell me. Yes, and I heard serotonin. What did you say? Mm -hmm. It destroys it. Pew, gone. So every time an individual, yourself or children or adults you work with, have a, a stress episode, their serotonin is depleted because of the cortisol system demanding activities of the brain that will demand consumption of serotonin and gradually destruction of synapses, in particular in the hippocampus. Hippocampus in autism and depression have been found as smaller than uh, the person with less stress. Okay. I know that you have been introduced to the importance of sound. I meet, um, oh, it's so long ago, um, 98 maybe, um, Professor Horvitz. He's uh, at the time in Columbia University. And what does he find? He's studying the impact of visual input and auditory input. And he says, pleasurable, pleasurable auditory and visual information will increase production of serotonin and dopamine. So when I meet with him, because that's what I do, I go and see people or I make them come and I talk to them, I say, okay, how do you discover? Well, they drill a hole in the cranium and they have little pipes and they can measure. So it's very, very uh, mathematical, verifiable. I say, 
Okay, what is pleasurable auditory for the cat? Because he works with cats. And he says, well, I go by the cage and I clap. So, All right. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to do that to the kids. serotonin in your brain, in the child's brain, in anybody you know's brain. Research, again, functional MRI, very recently, showed us that a pleasant sound. So what is pleasant? That's a question. What is pleasant sound? Or pleasant music? Pleasant music, how would you define? What would be the words coming to you? Makes you feel good. Soft? Calm? Yeah, every, all of that is perfect. And what, how they define it in science is consonant. Opposed to whatever your teenager is listening to. Dissonant. And I know that all this is something that will speak to you as information is following the heartbeat rhythm, something that goes with the body rhythm. So this will increase production of serotonin and dopamine in the brain. Is that a complicated protocol? You have it at home. You just don't do it like randomly music in the car, nice. Yes, music in the elevator. Oh, I don't think they have music here in this elevator. You want it, okay? You, you want to pick your, your, uh, your piece. Um, you want to do a certain amount of time. Five to 10 minutes is the minimum. Sometimes I work with teenagers. They are not <laughs> going to listen to that. So we say, okay, 10 minutes, lie down. Done. If you're listening, it's going to work on you. So we have a given time that is minimum. You have totally the capacity to do much more than that. Don't you want that? Come on. So how do you know your serotonin is increasing? Well, you feel mellow, right? You feel good, you feel calm. This is the serotonin increase. MAPS 1. This is so complicated, so hard to understand. You need to maybe stretch or, you know, okay, be ready, yeah, yes. All right, yeah, it does mean something. It means monitored, which means we know exactly where in the brain we are, monitored multicortical, different areas of the brain at the same time, activities for additional pathways and synapses. More meat. So we are also maybe one of the particularity of maps is using several senses at the same time, senses or cortical functions. We have an exercise that I'm not going to show on slides, but just to give you an idea before we start MAPS 1, just to make a goof of myself, it's not done yet. Um, we would have, let's say, a 13 years old um, with ADHD, difficulty to focus, wear a blindfold. This is all already to start a difficult job put a blindfold on somebody and measure the heartbeat. You see the level of anxiety of that person. Then we would ask him to walk with a blindfold on a two by four. Not happening in my life. <laughs> okay, well, please don't, please would you? Uh, and to make it even more interesting for the brain, we ask this child to hold hands in the front and we put a cookie tray between the hands 
and he has to press real hard so that it can uh, hold and walk. So can you imagine how many areas of the brain are working? And I tell the parents, we're not doing circus number. I don't care if he does it. I want him to think about it. And that's already enough because the brain will want to protect that child and will create the pathways that are needed to eventually one day do it. So this is the kind of multi-areas, multi-cortical activities. So for MAPS-1, we are going to use complicated equipment once again. Things that you have to shop around the town and the state to find. You're going to need a scent, which can be uh, just a skin of an orange. That works. You're going to need a beautiful picture. And I need the sound for this one. He's cooing, I'm pretty sure. Maybe. He is um, two, two months old. Look the attention. He is so focused. Looking at the picture and smelling. We have two brain areas working at the same time and being connected because we repeat that twice a day. One little thing that you may have noticed is the mouth salivation, which is a very good sign of um, brain health, is when you have a response that's appropriate. When, so we smell, then we smell and we look. I usually tell the parents, okay, a picture of strawberry will do. We don't want something complicated. We want the visual system to be working. And then we are going to put down the smell and the picture, and we will do the feel. Okay. Do you rub an orange on your baby? Today, yeah. Starting today, you do. Apple, potato, if you clean it, carrot, turnip, they all feel so fun. This is a very good approach to work on anorexia or any feeding disorder. Look at that. Yeah. He is totally happy. Is that a lovely moment? And we tell mom, talk. Talk to that child. The exercise in itself is probably taking maximum of two minutes. And every time you've done it, you have multiplied serotonin and dopamine production. Two minutes, twice a day. So we review what you need. You pick a theme, whatever fruit you have in the house. Gentle touch. Remember, the more surface you are going to cover, the more pathways you create on this fantastic air touch area. <laughs> this is a very good point, and I love that question. The hand is warm, and you may have a conflict. If you are a professional, it is sometimes better to use an object. And sometimes for between mom and the child, it gives a different type of information. I totally agree. Like when I recommend gentle claw, we use the hand and we cuddle the neck and the back. For MAPS-1, we multiply the um, amount of information. By bringing this feel, it's kind of smooth, it's kind of cool, it's more. We want to create more information. When you give a nice uh, rub with an orange, it's smooth. You use a banana, it's kind of um, grippy. So the idea is more information in less amount of time and also sometimes with our children who have difficulties with food, they will let food on their arm. And that's one step.
towards the math. So that's one of the reasons. Also, um, the question could be asked, why do we look at a picture? Because we have the orange uh, right there. This is also using science. When every time you look at an object, and that has been verified with functional MRI again, activation starts in the white matter. This is so exciting to know that we can promote activation in the white matter for people who cannot move. And you see that you can verify this with infants who, if you bring an object, they will want to take it. We are starting to move before we move. So we use smell, smell, and a picture that is not really an object. Then we use the object for feel. Did I answer your question? I answered to a dozen. That's the way I am. <laughs> Any other question in that? Yes. Um, that, that parent, when she was doing the treatment, did not know, in fact, that he does have a developmental issue. So I have been using this protocol in NICU. Babies with Pierre Robin syndrome, if you're familiar with that, or CHARD association, where children have no functional cranial nerves. So they will have a trach and they are tube fed and they are tied up in their bed for a year. They don't have a palate, so if you were putting food in the mouth, it would go through the nose. So those children had enormous developmental issues and no capacity to develop familiarity with food. So we were doing MAPS-1 and gradually those babies would be sent home, still with a trach, before surgery, around five months old. Because we found, we observed, that those babies had developed a new way to swallow. So they would use their neck because the vagal system was dysfunctional. So anything food by mass would go in the lungs possibly. So that type of protocol has initially um, health uh, development. And environmental enrichment. This is what MAPS promote, and I know that this is something that is um, really dear to many of you. What do I mean by environmental enrichment? Well, let's go back again to Wilbur and to the first initial animal research. How did they find that enrichment of the environment, which is sensory enrichment, would change the brain. What they did was, OK, different type of models, the, the cage with a friend, the cage with nobody, the cage with friends and toys, then cut off the, the brains, measure the surface, the weight, more neurons, more um, uh, blood vessels, more everything. We have another example, like party for rats, friends, good food, I don't know what they drank, but really fun, fun time. And the little, like, very clean, you don't get, you don't catch anything because everything is so clean, white cage, and you have your food on time, and, well, you don't need fun because you're fed and you sleep, and that's it, you're a rat. And measuring the brains, the difference was even worse than we can imagine. Not only fun, fun, party time, good food, um, would present bigger brain, more pathways, more communication, more capacities, but in the sterile environment, so clean and so tidy, the brain had shrunk. There were smaller brain, less pathways. That's where I want to be. I want to go there. I want to give those children the option. 
not, no money. This is not a matter of um, lack of information. It's lack of finance. You cannot, you don't have toys enough. You don't, so this is sterile environment. Or this is sterile environment. No information. You have the food. You probably are clean. You're alive. And what has been found in the last probably 30 years where studies were, were run in orphanages was the tremendous amount of children with autism. How come? What would be the relation? Is that a genetic problem? Any questions so far? This is um, sort of challenging us, right? Um, how are we going to change one or two things in our own environment? This is probably one of the most exciting discovery of the last 10 years, that enriched brains will resist assault. We are not protected forever from having a stroke or aging. Well, I'm not ever aging, ever. Like, it shows I'm old, but I'm not. Inside, I'm all young. I'm 270. <laughs> and this is my grandson. <laughs> so don't you think we are all a little bit afraid and we are all in need of enrichment? Are we all safe or not? Well, I guess we're not. So, Professor Lien, we developed a friendship with time because it was, this woman is crazy, but she's got onto something. And he decided to put his name and reputation on running a study on maps. And it took him seven years running around, presenting to different associations, foundations, and the government. Uh, to present and be accepted to run the study at the University of California. So he presented by showing um, in Boston, at the National Institute for Mental Health, what we know. And what we know about instinct, how typically uh, the mother would um, deal with the baby when she doesn't have a cell phone, or a car, or a laptop, or no target. <laughs> we don't have target in Canada. That's why I have to come so often. So where is the child? In the not so pink moms. These pictures belong to Dr. Lian, and I borrowed them. And so statistics. How long a day? 24 hours, right? How long of those 24 hours is the pink baby, Northern America um, baby, is held, touched? How many hours a day? So that's, we'll pass around the question, and you win the call at TV offered by the hotel. I have one in my room. It's not screwed to the piece of furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, oh, come on. You're mad at your daughter-in-law. So, keep, keep, three hours, keep going. 24 hours, eight hours. One hour, keep going. Yeah, how, many, how much touching? Ten hours. Well, we met, put all this in a box, and we, and we get the answer. So, did this remind you of something? Where is the baby when we are on the phone? Or we, we don't say, I can't talk to you, I'm playing with my baby. Say, okay, wait a minute. It's not us, right? We don't do that, but it happens. So, neurogenesis is the answer to our problem in the future when you are going to get old, because I'm not, or this is how we want to finish up, right? You work real hard uh, getting the children to a point and how to finish up. I recently was working with um, a little boy uh, dad has been doing a detox for years and says, okay, he's okay now, but his IQ is 70. And he says, I don't have a supplement for that. So I said, let's, <laughs> we're going to talk. So we worked. And neurogenesis is the way to move on and to finish up. That, that doctor, Dr. Aladdin, is that not a pretty name? Dr. Aladdin? Come on, it's pretty. Um, treated two of very severe cases. One um, schizophrenia young man, both of them are 18. Um, and the other one is bipolar. And they are in hospital, so he can do maths with them every day. And he says, I thought, I thought it was not sleeping enough when I checked the IQ. <laughs> I, had, I read the math, I read all the protocols, and sure enough, they had gained 20 points IQ. We don't, um, that's not what we say to parents. Um, when you work with families, you work on the dysfunction of the unhappiness and the seizures or memory loss, but that extra thing that comes with a healthy brain, you want it to happen. So a quick review. I'll put it around the end so that um, maybe if you're sleeping, I don't know. This is what happens. Look at the slide. On the, um, if you are not sure, this is how it happened. These are real neuro neurons. Let's say four months into an enrichment program and a year. This is what we call population. This is what we call dendrogenesis. So working on the uh, cells that are here, and they are already working, they're doing something, they're not dormant, put them to work more, they'll grow new branches. Or access the population of dormant cells and put them to work. Those dormant cells will be the ones that die. Good news, the 300, nobody knows exactly, 300, 500,000 a day that die, ouch. Imagine I'm 275 multiplied by, we don't want to know. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing maths, right? There's nothing funny in there. When I first meet this child, I'll put the sound more. 
the diagnosis is severe mental retardation, severe autism. We are not really interested by labels. We're interested by how much is he hurting. He doesn't talk. He has one word, the word no. He is violent. And people, sometimes adults who work with him, think he is mean. Children are never mean. They are violent because they are afraid. He is constantly in motion. This is one of our pieces of assessment. And uh, probably in many uh, neurological assessments, spending more than 70% of the wake hours moving, right? Uh, throwing, no imaginary play. Look at that. This is, I'm so afraid. He is very strong like people who are upset, the cortisol system, throwing things that are very heavy, like it's nothing. So when the mother comes, she is not doing anything anymore. Different things have been tried that didn't help him, because every child is so different. So as you know, they don't respond um, all the same way. So she is um, really, um, worried for this uh, kid. Running, if you know those children who need to run, and throwing, and etc. No eye contact, no interaction, and the mother is, like all the mothers that you know, is caring, is soft, she's gentle, she has no aggression, she doesn't raise her tone, and she still cannot help him. And this is where Luke discovered he needed to start sports, because he's such a good catcher. We're going to see that in a second. And in fact, Jaden taught me a lot, because now I'm going to have a session of less toys. I used to have half hour between sessions, because I needed a half hour to clean up. So we do maps. And we do maps one, that you have seen. We do a gentle claw, which you saw. And music. And this is four months later. He has imaginary play. A toy is a toy, a dinosaur is a dinosaur. He has interaction. How do those things happen? If your serotonin level is better, if you feel good, if you can focus, make choices, if you're running all the time, you cannot really make choices, right? He has 40 words by that time. I've had people tell me, well, it's got lobotomy. <laughs> and as you know, as you've heard comments, like, it's not possible. It's too good to be true. So that's behavior example. Let me show you now um, an, a problem with facial paralysis. If you work with children or adults with ser severe cerebral palsy, you have worked with people having facial paralysis. The constant smile, where their teeth grow out, really they are not smiling, they just cannot. Uh, close their mouth. They cannot speak properly because they cannot touch. So you're going to see this example here with uh, Nicholas. So he has the smile 
and he tries to help himself talk by pushing his lip. And we have the same words on both sides. This is just weeks separating the two. No more smile if he doesn't want to smile. No more mouth, lip infection. I had those horrible sentences like, I love chocolate, my mom eats. Okay. This one is um, a 12 year old with also cerebral palsy. We work here on the breathing. So on the left, no capacity to close the lip around the whistle. On the right, she whistles really well. This is visible, like I like to call them, where I ask exactly the same thing on both. Day one on the first assessment, put your leg up, and absolutely no response on the left. And on the right, big Canadian snow boots. On the left, wheelchair, on the right, walking. The difference between the two is now the brain is telling the legs to do the job. I am sometimes a little bit harsh and cutting with the parents when I say if your child has legs, your child doesn't have a leg problem if he's not walking. You have legs, you don't have a leg problem. You have a brain problem. And so we promote brain plasticity and neurogenesis. We use the natural roads. We have spoken about touch and smell. There are many others, vestibular system, so many other uh, possibilities. I hope uh, that I gave you uh, a little uh, direction that you can be using in your practice or you can be using it with your families. And now it's question time. <laughs> Thank you so much. My serotonin. <laughs> so, yes? Um, I could see, that, of course, the application with, with the, the children. Um, and there's, I'm sure, so many that need this kind of treatment. I couldn't help but think about the population of people out there that are older, say, into their 50s and 60s, 70s, who might want to have increased cognitive function. Do you see a market for this and an Absolutely. application? The, f the first reaction of Dr. Lian, who is the one to discover dopamine, and we know dopamine and memory, he said, that's what he said. I don't say it. He said, this will cure Alzheimer's. So I worked with um, people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and I saw uh, the, the benefits. The issue with adults is we need, with MAPS, we need a caregiver. And the issue with a caregiver and an adult is Alzheimer, five-year-old, but 81, I don't want to do it. You can tell a five-year-old, when well, you're still doing it. So the difficulty is in the transfer, but yes, absolutely. Absolutely, we'll need to work with seniors. I have a question related to the orange, and I understand. You? <laughs> you probably can't see me, I'm in the light. Okay. So, um, but I understand with the holding that that helps the nervous system of the child to entrain, so it's very healthy for the child and doesn't necessarily overstimulate the nervous system holding. Although if the orange is moved around the face, I'm wondering if you ever look for cues that maybe there's an uh, uh, overstimulation that may be happening oh, yeah. and collapsing. And yes. I'm wondering what, you look, what, what types of cues do you look for? Well, any, um, it all depends, of course, if the uh, child or adult is dysfunctional or not. Uh, but you will have <laughs> the pushing of hands or agitation or facial expression or whining and my recommendation to parents is always if the child doesn't like it you stop that's 
the um, rule with maps. No stress, and you don't make the child do it. So the parents know, and if they are in doubt, you show them. Maybe you do it a few times, as you see there, not liking. So certainly we look and we stop. I do some allergy treatments that are natural. I would suggest that if a person is allergic to something that you not use something like that. For instance, blood type A's generally don't t tolerate orange juice well. Mm -hmm. If that child is a blood type A, they're allowed to suffer severely. I've seen them put a vial of, of a substance that they're allergic to and they break out in a sweat. And um, I, I would be cautious of that. You said any smell will work. I promise you not any smell will work. Only no. a few yes. will work. And the more natural they are, if they're a synthetic smell, they're not going to work on hardly anybody. No, you're right. Uh, as far as the uh, stimulation of the olfactory system, it has definitely to be pleasurable, and it has to not be in the family of allergies. You're absolutely right, and that's part of the therapeutic approach is to being cautious about that, certainly. Thank you for making that comment. Would you, um, would you, say, would you say something about uh, how we can learn this protocol? What, what kind of trainings you have? And yes. You, and All right, yeah. So we have, um, we want people to know. So we have different modes of training. We have one that we call the boot camp, that is a certain number of hours, usually over three days, where we go where people are, depending if it's a group of professionals or if it's a group of families. If we work with a family, we want to do the boot camp with that family intense training, telling them everything they need to know, showing them how to do it, and visit the house, and evaluate the environment, ensuring that nothing is in contradiction with health or with development. So people have a hard time finding us because we are not very visible. We have been a little bit visible against our will, but um, you know how it is, you make enemies. Sometimes when you try something, uh, that's fantastic. So uh, we have a website. I don't know, um, you have, we have flyers there. People would call us. We have a lot of personal contact with professionals or families. I speak with them. And we um, either train the caregivers, or we train the families, or we train the, the professional who want to introduce that inside their practice. A few protocols that will just promote a better success of what they are already doing. So everything basically as far as training exists in our little system. We are small, so we are mobile. We're going to Australia next month. Um, I hope we go to Germany very soon. Um, and we need professionals to know and to practice and to use it. Because our mission is no family is afraid ever again. So um, that means uh, personal contact. We have a toll free number. You call and you speak to one member of the team, or you give the contact to the families. And we like to go where they are. And if that doesn't happen, we have all kinds of level of treatments, of cost, so that a cost for a family is not so overbearing that, OK, they have to uh, take several night jobs to uh, cover that. So accessing us is a word of mouth job. You telling somebody, you ha knowing a family who is at a point in the treatment with you, maybe they need uh, to uh, introduce neurogenesis into their work. and. Um, through that word of mouth, communication, um, and training. We 
we're, we, don't, we didn't have all the ideas. They are all coming from uh, people who need it. Would you briefly talk about your seizure protocol? I was so impressed. Uh, first time I tried that, it was like a miracle. And would you just sort of describe it to the audience? Yes. Like, here you have a kid who is seizing a lot, and they, they go into a seizure right in your office. What you do? All right. It's um, fantastic. This is unbelievable. Um, I was mentioning uh, earlier that um, I've worked in the NICU be using one cent because that was the one I had in my lab coat. So when I was working with those babies, I would use that sand that we use now, which is a blend. And base, the basis is strawberry. And I have no idea why. Like, I don't say, uh, this is going to do this, this is going to do that. I don't know, except for that one, because clinically, I've seen hundreds of cases where there is a stronger response. So using the sense of smell, as you remember, is going to promote increased production of dopamine, control of movement, motivation, like the mastery of the brain. Suddenly the brain is back into knowing what to do. The seizure is the massive mistake. The electrical message is uh, going and firing in the wrong directions, and it can be any form of seizure that you know. How do we stop that mistake? By sending one simple linear message that's very strong with the brain, no matter the situation, the brain will say, I'm stopping what I'm doing to protect the person. This is called using an ice cube. You would have an ice cube in a Ziploc bag, or um, some parents grab a bag of peas in the freezer, and you want to have a short contact, let me do it to this gentleman. So let's imagine he is having a seizure. So that would be my smell. This is <laughs> my ice cube. I put the smell to the nose. Well, I'll touch on this side, right under the ear. Lobe. Where is your ear, baby? There. Somewhere. Ear one, Mississippi, two, Mississippi. Then we go under the armpit. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. I do the Mississippi thing because people tend to do what do you When you are afraid, yeah. you do it. Especially in the seizure situation. Absolutely. Time so you panic. Through. If you have those two information at the same time, five seconds for a grandma, whichever seizure, the seizure stops. Because the brain says, stop. Whatever mistake we were doing, we're no longer doing it. Now we are back, and because of the increase of dopamine, we are back right. And so the seizure stops, and the child settles, and gradually what you observe is the recovery time is shorter and shorter. You would have three days recovery time, turn in three hours, turn in 10 minutes. This is knowledge. You transfer it, it's for free. When we, it's almost by mistake we were doing this, and when medical professionals said, you have something, give it to the community, we called the National Association for uh, Epilepsy. And I told them, I want to give you a protocol. They said, oh, give? Um, we'll call you back. <laughs> it was 15 years ago. So it's, it's for free because seizures are killing. So you use it, you teach your families, you do it during the consult, the child is having a seizure, you have a pack of ice inside your little fridge, you have your scent, and you do it. Children deserve it. Yes? Yes. Yes, sense of touch and uh, olfactory at the same time. It's very crucial. Some kids may be extremely mobile during a seizure. You figure a way. Uh, you may have a larger piece of cotton or tissue, but contact. We, we have three points, earlobe, armpit, and here. I forgot the name. Right. There you go. And 
If the seizure is not done when you are number three, which is six seconds, you start again on the other side. You very rare, have to um, do it more than one, the way, one side and the other. The seizure would be done. Uh, I have a quick question. Now, in uh, grand mal seizures, uh, people, children, also hold their breath sometimes for a scaringly long time. Uh, will it still work even if they don't breathe? Uh, they are going to breathe at one point. You wait for that. Yes. Okay. You just leave your cotton and you do the ice. Maybe the ice is going to arrive as a message before of the olfaction. You just do the two. And eventually there's going to be breathing and this, it will happen. Sometimes you have myoclonic that are so short. You say, oh, by the time you go to the ice and the scent is done, well, the brain is not healthy yet. Even if the seizure is done, you want to do the protocol. So I have somebody here and there. Yes? Did you ever work in adult acute psychosis cases? Did in I adult, ever? In adult acute psychosis case. Yes. No, somebody in yes. psychosis. Yeah. You, you well, um, in um, the group home we were working with, we had um, profound, severe crisis where they would use totally strawberry and ice. This is recovery during, you saw the scent for the little girl, smell, three seconds to hit and have an effect, and then ice. Of course, you have to have the person let you come near, but you may have a very cold towel that you put on the floor if the person is pacing. Um, you, cr you become creative, I guess. Yes. We've done the seizure protocol a lot with my son. And, and when you're having a grand mal seizure or a child's having a grand mal seizure, you kind of have to adapt things. And one thing that we found is if we rub a little bit of the oil on our fingers and we just actually touch right underneath their nose, it, it's there, and then we can focus on the other part of the job because it, it can be a little overwhelming. The other thing is she has graciously produced about 25 videos that have all this beginning essential information that you can share with her clients. It's unlimitedbrain.com backslash samples, right? And what I advise parents to do is go do her videos. Do the stuff that's free that they're offering and they're going to see the benefit, and then they're going to want to do the next step. But very few people will share the amount of time that she has for people to prove that something works and then go from there. Just a, a, a quick comment. This uh, a woman over here who just spoke, this is the famous Dana Gorman, <laughs> who is uh, the leader of our autism think tank. Uh, this is the woman I owe everything uh, to her, know about autism, and she's a great leader in the field. And she introduced me to Claudie. And uh, we have a wonderful website that Dana has uh, uh, really personally sort of created. It's thrive.com. And thrive has three eyes in it. I never found out why. I think the one with one eye was taken. And then <laughs> she said three is better than, you know, and she wanted to do two. And then she said, why stop at two? So she put three eyes in there, thrive.com. Um, it's a great website where a lot of the, the knowledge, certainly everything I know is in there and a thousand more things. And there's a couple of Claude's uh, video clips are in there. Um, so you can look it up there also, yeah, thrive.com. And, and since Dana has a lot of energy, don't hesitate in the br time after this talk, tonight, tomorrow, to corner her and find out everything that she knows. She is a storehouse of information. Yes. Um, my question is, when you do the soft claw, that um, figure eight or circle, um, I was surprised that you're using a gentle touch because my experience is that the children with autism that I've worked with really crave that deep touch. Yes. So why did you... I I'm happy that you bring it back because I was short on it. Mm -hmm. I mentioned we use the receptors that will take 
the touch message to the brain are inside the skin. If you try to access a different type of information for touch, you won't. You have to go through skin. S craving uh, pressure is a mistake. If you give in, if you do um, squeeze and sit on the child, and you give a temporary relief, but you tell the brain the mistake is right, is okay. We want to rehabilitate. This is the picture of the baby with a cross. Some kids will not accept soft. So we are not doing that, but we're going to do tip of finger very lightly. This he will accept. That's the first step. We are at the right place in the right manner. And then we can do three fingers. And maybe I can touch your knee. And so we gradually rehabilitate. It's like after taking a cast of a broken leg, you take a few steps and you sit. We do the same. We're very respectful. And if your child wants to burn his hand because this is what he likes, you'll say, I can't let you. Same with the squeezing. It is just temporary relief. It's not helping. Do it because this child needs it. A big hug, yes. But let's work on rehabilitation of those receptors that are in the skin. Second question is the part about the taste. Because you, I think you skipped over that. Yes. Because it is not really part of a therapeutic treatment, it is um, to be approached cautiously. This is the fun part. It is also in my treatment when it is OK, no allergies, no problems could be um, coming from there. You could do with water. It is fantastic speech exercise because of the motion of the lips, the tongue that comes out, and the motion of the inner mouth. You get an incredible voluntary motion that you cannot get any other way. So I would tell a parent with a cautious uh, recommendation, make sure there is no problem, dab your finger, rub on the bottom lip. Nothing inside the mouth, no, nothing to chew or swallow, because that could be a motor exercise, but just gentle rub and then let everything happen. So taste is the fifth part of MAPS-1 that as professional you probably could not be doing in your uh, office because maybe it's a new child, you don't know the allergies, you cannot keep fresh juice in your fridge constantly, but you can definitely do a little bit of uh, water. And salt water or sugar water would work. Yes? Is there any work being done on self or robotic administration of MAPS for the older patients? I did not understand the first part. Is there any work being done for self-administration or possibly robotic administration? Uh, yeah. We are th seriously lacking money to create what we call the bear chair, where somebody could sit and have so, uh, like uh, a robotic arm. That's doing an excellent idea. Yeah. Yeah, we have the idea. We, are, we don't have the money to make it work. But we can do that. Self-administration, in my office, I have a scent and I have a back scratcher with dollar store. Um, there are many things that you can do on your own. Um, and for uh, the elderly, if we could enter the, the, the homes and teach the nurses or teach the staff, uh, what a step. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me. Hi. Um, where can I get some of this? Uh because I think I want to put it on all of my clothing and my house. And can you overdose on it? Or is it just, you know? The, the scent? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The scent is, you, you can get on, uh, we have a website called mapsessentials.com. And you can find the knickknacks, the art, the fruit picture, different kinds of scents. Not big, that's not our expertise, the essential oils or smell, scents. But we are very cautious about safety. And there were so many different things out there. People would buy smell to make candles with that are so toxic. So we found people that were safe. And so you can find there. Or go and have fun 
go on the website called tantrum911.com and you will see other videos of kids having tantrums topped with the smell and also through there you can uh, get the little smell tantrum. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Pardon me? Music? Uh, iTunes? <laughs> Uh, music is everywhere, it's for free. Um, I don't have a specific recommendation, beautiful. What I tell the parents often is go to Walmart, turn the, the, the CD, check if you know the city the orchestra is playing in. That's usually a good recommendation. Um, good orchestra, good music, soundtracks of movies, that works. We have the gentleman there and then it's you. I yeah. have no experience with treating um, people with seizures. I've stopped them sometime, but never tried to treat them by accident. Um, all sensory information on one side goes to the opposite brain through the ipsilateral cord um, cerebellum, but olfactory goes to the same side. Is there any way to tie that down, make it use faster, or, or use that information in any yes, way? Yes, I, I do have exercises to repair corpus callosum. I worked with kids with no corpus callosum, so we had to create other areas. So I have an exercise where I have the children dip their hands, one in fresh water, one in warm, bath temperature, not boiling and freezing. So we do use that, absolutely. Um, if there is a tool, you can probably find it in one of these, I don't know how many hundreds exercises uh, I created because I create new ones for every new child, basically. So it's absolutely something we need to do. During seizure, you don't want to do too much. It's already a lot. One very strong info is already a lot. Yes? I don't know what it is, so I don't know. Yeah, MAPS is using things that parents with no training can do. So if I tell them music and they want more, okay, uh, symphonic, and uh, if you like it, I'm, I don't give them too much of sophistication. Uh, more things are possible, I guess, but we use the simple thing that people have in the house usually, so far. <laughs> so far. Well, I am, I live under the number five of your phone, if you did not know that. So please call us because we have more to, to say and to give. And so I hope uh, you get in touch with us and um, we can help the families you work with. Representative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>